Continuing Arethus from Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Bryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough. Then the rest of them, sitting down, put off their shoes, because men both make less noise and also climb surer if they go up ladders barefooted. Well. Perhaps in the sandal things that they wore, but um, there's boots that are better at it than your bare feet. Um, but Erginus, taking with him seven young men dressed like travelers, got unobserved to the gate and killed the sentry with the other guards. And at the same time, the ladders were clapped to the walls, and Aratus, having in great haste got up a hundred men, commanded the rest to follow as they could, and immediately drawing up his ladders after him, he marched through the city with his hundred men towards the castle, being already overjoyed that he was undiscovered, and not doubting of the success. Now, quieter, maybe, yeah. While still they were some way off, a watch of four men came with a light, who did not see them, because they were still in the shade of the moon, but were seen plainly enough themselves, as they came on directly towards them, so withdrawing a little way amongst some walls and plots for houses. They lay in wait for them, and three of them they killed. But the fourth, being wounded in the head with a sword, fled crying out that the enemy was in the city, and immediately the trumpet sounded, and all the city was in an uproar at what had happened, and that the streets were full of people running up and down, and many lights were seen shining both below in the town and above in the castle, and a confused noise was to be heard in all parts. In the meantime, Aratus was hard at work, struggling to get up the rocks, at first slowly, with much difficulty, straying continually from the path, which lay deep and was overshadowed with the cranks, leading to the wall with many windings and turnings. But the moon immediately, and as if by miracle, it is said, dispersing the clouds, shone out and gave light to the most difficult part of the way, until he got to that part of the wall he desired, and there she overshadowed and hid him, the clouds coming together again. The soldiers whom Aratus had left outside the gate, near Juno's temple, to the number of three hundred entering the town, now full of tumult and lights, not knowing the way by which the former had gone, and finding no track of them, slunk aside and crowded together, in one body, under a flank of the cliff, that cast a strong shadow. And there stood and waited in great distress and perplexity, for by this time those that had come with Aratus were attacked with missiles from the citadel, and were busy fighting. And a sound of cries of battle came down from above, and a loud noise echoed back and back from the mountain sides. And therefore, confused and uncertain whence it proceeded, was heard on all sides, they being thus in doubt which way to turn themselves. Archelaus, the commander of Antigonus's troops, having a great number of soldiers with him, made up towards the castle with great shouts and noise of trumpets to fall upon Aratus's people, and pass by the three hundred, who, as if they had risen out of an ambush, immediately charged him killing the first they encountered, and so affrighted the rest, together with Archelaus, that they put them to flight, and pursued them until they had quite broken, and dispersed them about the city. No sooner were they defeated, but Erginus came to them, from those that were fighting above, to acquaint them that Aratus was engaged with the enemy, who defended themselves very stoutly, and there was a fierce conflict at 
the very wall, in need of speedy help. They, therefore, desired him to lead them on without delay, and marching up by their shouts, made their friends understand who they were and encouraged them by the full moon shining on their arms, made them in the long line by which they advanced appear more in number to the enemy than they were, and the echo of the night multiplied their shouts. In short, falling on with the rest, They made the enemy give way, and were masters of the castle and garrison, day now beginning to be bright, and the rising sun shining out upon their success. By this time also the rest of his army came up to Arathis from Sikaan, the Corinthians joyfully receiving them at the gates, and helping them to secure the king's party. And now, having put all things into a safe posture, he came down from the castle, to the theater, an infinite number of people crowding thither to see him and to hear what he would say to the Corinthians, therefore drawing up the Achaeans on each side of the stage passages. He came forward himself upon the stage, with his corselet still on and his face, showing the effects of all his hard work and want of sleep, so that his natural exultation and joyfulness of mind were overborne by the weariness of his body. The people, as soon as he came forth, breaking out into great applauses and the congratulations, he took his spear in his right hand, and resting his body upon it, with his knee a little bent, stood a good while in that posture, silently receiving their shouts and acclamations, while they extolled his valor, and wondered at his fortune. Which being over, standing up, he began an oration in the name of the Akatans, suitable to the late action. Persuading the Corinthians to associate themselves to the Akatans, and with all delivered up to them the keys of their gates, which had never been in their power since the time of King Philip, of the captains of Antigonus. He dismissed Archelaus, whom he had taken prisoner, and Theophrastus, who refused to quit his post, he put to death. As for Persaus, when he saw the castle was lost, he had gone away to Can where some time after discoursing with one that said to him that the wise man is only a true general indeed he replied none of Zeno's maxims once pleased me better than this but I have been converted to another opinion of the young men of Zika'an this is told by many of Persaas Aretas immediately after made himself master of the temple of Juno, and having an haven of Lekaam seized upon five and twenty of the king's ships, together with five hundred horses and four hundred sarians. These he sold. The Akaans kept guard in the Acrocrintus with a body of four hundred soldiers and fifty dogs with as many keepers. No, Juno with the Jupiter and Black Atom. Don't remember what exactly what that's supposed to be over. Um, where's that a place? Um, Jupiter actually, they think, has absorbed other planets. The Romans extolling. Philopoemen called him the last of the Grecians, as if no great man had ever since his time been bred amongst them, but 
I shall call this capture of the Acro Grintas, the last of the Grecian exploits, being comparable to the best of them, both for the daringness of it and the success, as was presently seen by the consequences. For the Megarians, revolting from Antigonus, joined Aratus, and the Troezenians and Epidarians enrolled themselves in the Achaean community, and issuing forth for the first time he entered Attica, and passing over to Salamis, he plundered the island, turning the Achaean force every way, as it were, just let out a prison, and turning the Achaean force every way, as if it were just let out of prison and set at liberty. All freemen whom he took, he sent back to the Athenians without ransom, as a sort of first invitation to them to come over to the League, he made Ptolemy become a confederate of the Achaeans, with the privilege of command both by sea and land, and so great was his power with them that since he could not by law be chosen their general every year, yet every other year he was, and by his counsels and actions was, in effect, always so. For they perceived that neither riches nor reputation, nor the friendship of kings, nor the private interest of his own country, nor anything else was so dear to him as the increase of the, of the Achaean's power and greatness, for he believed that the cities, weak individually, could be preserved by nothing else but a mutual assistance under the closest bond of the common interest, and as the members of the body live and breathe by the union of all in a single natural growth, and on the dissolution of this, when once they separate, pine away, and putrefy, in the same manner are cities ruined by being dissevered, as well as preserved when, as the members of one great body, we enjoy the benefit of that province and council that govern the whole, now being distressed to see that, whereas the chief neighboring cities enjoyed their own laws and liberties, the Argives were in bondage. He took counsel for destroying their tyrant, Aristomachus, being very desirous both to pay his debt of gratitude to the city, where he had been bred up by restoring it its liberty, and to add so considerable a town to the Achaeans. Now, were there some wanting who had the courage to undertake the thing of whom Ascalus and Cremenus, the soothsayer, were the chief. But they wanted swords, for the tyrant had prohibited the keeping of any under a great penalty. Therefore Aratus, having provided some small daggers at Corinth, and hid them in the pack saddles of some pack horses that carried ordinary wear, sent them to Argos, but Carimenus letting another person into the design. Ascalus and his partners were angry at it, and henceforth would have no more to do with them, and took their measure by themselves, and Carimenus, on finding this, went out of anger and informed against them just as they were on their way to attack the tyrant. However, the most of them made a shift to escape out of the marketplace and fled to Corinth. Not long after, Aristomachus was slain by some slaves, and Aristippus, a worse tyrant than he, seized the government. Upon this, Arathus, mustering all the Achaeans present that were of age, hurried away to the aid of the city, believing that he should find the people ready to join with him, but the greater number being by this time habituated to slavery and content to submit, and no one coming to join him, he was obliged to retire, having more exposed the Achaeans to the charge of committing acts of hostility in the midst of peace, upon which account they were sued before the Mantineans and Aratus, not making his appearances, Aristippus gained the cause, and had damages allowed him to the value of thirty mina. And now hating and fearing Aratus, he sought means to kill him. 
having the assistance herein of King Antigonus, so that Aratus was perpetually dodged and watched by those that waited for an opportunity to do this service. But there is no such safeguard of a ruler as the sincere and steady goodwill of his subjects, for where both the common people and the principal citizens have the fears not of but for the governor, he sees with many eyes and hears with many ears whatsoever is doing. Therefore, I cannot but here stop short a little in the course of my narrative to describe the manner of life which so much envied arbitrary power and the so much celebrated and admired pomp and pride of absolute government obliged Aristippus to lead, for though Antigonus was his friend and ally, and though he maintained numerous soldiers to act as his bodyguard, and had not left one enemy his alive in the city, yet he was forced to make his guard in camp of the colonnade about his house, and for his servants he turned them all out immediately after supper, and then shutting up the doors upon them, he crept up into a small upper chamber, together with his mistress, through a trapdoor, upon which he placed his bed, and there slept after such a fashion as one in his condition can be supposed to sleep, that is, interruptedly and in fear. The latter was taken away in by the woman's mother, and locked up in another room. In the morning she brought it again, and putting it to, called up this brave and wonderful tyrant, who came crawling out like some creeping thing out of its hole, whereas Aratus, not by force of arms, but lawfully, and by his virtue, lived in possession of a firmly settled command. Wearing the ordinary coat and cloak, being the common and declared enemy of all tyrants, and has left behind him a noble race of descendants surviving among the Grecians to this day, while those occupiers of citadels and maintainers of bodyguards who made all this use of arms and gates and bolts to protect their lives, in some few cases, perhaps, escaped like the hare from the hunters, but in no instance have we, either house or family, are so much as a tomb to which any respect is shown, remaining to preserve the memory of any one of them. Against this, Aristippus, therefore, Aratus made many open and many secret attempts, whilst he endeavored to take Argos, though without success once, particularly clapping scaling ladders in the night to the walls. He desperately got up upon it with a few of his soldiers and killed the guards that opposed him. But the day appearing, the tyrant set upon him on all hands, whilst the Argives, as if it had not been their liberty that was contended for, but some Nemean game going on for which it was their privilege to assign the prize, like fair and impartial judges, sat looking on in great quietness, Aratus, fighting bravely, was run through the thigh with a lance. Yet he maintained his ground against the enemy till night, and had he been able to go on and hold out that night also, he had gained this point, for the tyrant thought of nothing but flying, and had already shipped most of his goods, but Aratus, having no intelligence of this, and wanting water, being disabled himself by his wound, retreated with his soldiers, despairing henceforth to do any good this way. He fell openly with his army into Argolis, and plundered it, and in a fierce battle with Aristippus near the river Caras, he was accused of having withdrawn out of the fight, and thereby abandoned the victory. For whereas one part of his army had unmistakably got the better, and was pursuing the enemy at a good distance from him, he yet retreated in confusion into his camp, 
not so much because he was overpressured by those with whom he was engaged as out of mistrust of success and through a panic fear, and when the other wing, returning from the pursuit, showed themselves extremely vexed, that though they had put the enemy to flight and killed many more of his men than they had lost, yet those that were in a manner conquered should erect a trophy as conquerors, being much ashamed, he resolved to fight them again about the trophy, and the next day, but one drew up his army to give them battle, but perceiving that they were reinforced with fresh troops, and came on with better courage than before, he durst not hazard a fight, but retired, and sent to request a truce to bury his dead. However, by his dexterity in dealing personally with men, and managing political affairs, and by his great favor, he excused and obliterated this fault, and brought in Cleona to the Akaan Association, and celebrated the Nemean Games at Cleona as the proper and more ancient place for them. The games were also celebrated by the Argives at the same time, which gave the first occasion to the violation of the privilege of safe conduct and immunity always granted to those that came to compete for the prizes. The Akatans at that time selling as enemies all those they caught going through their country after joining in the games at Arcas. So vehement and implacable, a hater was he of the tyrants. Not long after, having noticed that Aristippus had a design upon Clana, but was afraid of him, because he then was staying in Corinth, he assembled an army by public proclamations, and commanding them to take, along with them, provisions for several days, he marched to Kencraa. Kencraa. Hoping by the stratagem to entice Aristippus to fall upon Cleana, when he supposed him far enough off. And so it happened, for he immediately brought his forces against it from Argos, but Aratus, returning from Cincrea to Corinth in the dusk of the evening, and setting post of his troops in all the roads, led on the Achaeans, who followed in such good order, and with so much speed and alacrity, uh, so much speed and alacrity that they were undiscovered by Aristippus. Well, if they waited till the twilight was gone, um, you know, about an hour and a half after sunset on average. Well, you get the vertical streaks for another 15, 20 minutes, but, you know. Um, not only whilst upon their march, but even when they got still in the night into Cleona and drew up, up in order of battle, and as soon as it was morning, the gates being opened and the trumpet sounding, he fell upon the enemy with great cries and fury, routed them at once, and kept close in pursuit. Following the course, which he most imagined Aristippus would choose, there being many turns that might be taken, and so the chase lasted as far as Makana, where the tyrant was slain by a certain cretin called Tragiscus, as as Dinias reports of the common soldiers, there fell above fifteen hundred. Yet through Aratus, though Aratus had attained so great a victory, and that too without the loss of a man, he could not make himself master of Argos, nor set it at liberty, because Agias and a younger Aristomachus 
got into the town with some of the king's forces and seized upon the government. However, by this exploit, he spoiled the scoffs and jests of those that flattered the tyrants, and in the raillery would say that the Akatan general was usually troubled with a looseness when he was to fight a battle, that the sound of a trumpet struck him with a drowsiness and a giddiness, and that when he had drawn up his army and given the word, he used to ask his lieutenants and officers whether there was any further need of his presence. Now the die was cast, and then went aloof to wait the result at a distance, for indeed these stories were so generally listened to that when the philosophers disputed whether to have one's heart beat and change color upon any apparent danger, be an argument of fear or rather of some distemperature and chilliness of bodily constitution, Aratus was always quoted as a good general who was always thus affected in time of battle. Having thus dispatched Aristippus, he advised with himself how to overthrow Ladiatus, the Megalopolitan, who held usurped power over his country. And this person was naturally of a generous temper and not insensible of true honor, and had been led into this wickedness not by the ordinary motives of other tyrants, licentiousness and rapacity, but being young and stimulated with a desire of glory. He had let his mind be unwarily prepossessed with the vain and false applauses given to tyranny as some happy and glorious thing, but he no sooner seized the government than he grew weary of the pomp and burden of it, and at once, emulating the tranquility and fearing of the policy of Aratus, he took the best resolutions. First, to free himself from hatred and fear from soldiers and guards, and secondly, to be the public benefactor of his country. And, sending for Aratus, he resigned the government and incorporated his city into the Akatan community. The Akatans, applauding this generous action, chose him their general. Upon which, desiring to outdo Aratus in glory amongst many other uncalled for things, he declared war against the Lucca Demonians, which Aratus opposing was thought to do it out of envy. And Ladiatus was the second time chosen general, though Aratus acted openly against him and labored to have the office conferred upon another, for Aratus himself had the command every other year, as had been said. Ladiatus, however, succeeded so well that his pretensions that he was thrice chosen general, governing alternately as did Aratus, but at last declaring himself his professed enemy and accusing him frequently to the Akatans. He was rejected and fell into a contempt. People now seeing that it was a contest between a counterfeit and a true unadulterated virtue, and as Asap tells us that the cuckoo, cuckoo, yeah, I presume that's the cuckoo, um, once asking the little birds why they flew away from her, was answered, because they feared she would once uh, she would one day prove to be a hawk. So, Lady Asses, Lady Asses's former tyranny still cast a doubt upon the reality of his change. She. So we're not referring to roosters here. Um, But Aratus gained a new honor in the Atalian War, for the Akatans resolving to fall upon the Atalians on the Megarian confines and Agis, also the Lacedaemonian king, who came to their assistance with an army, encouraging them to fight. Aratus opposed this determination, and patiently enduring many reproaches 
many scoffs and jerks at his soft and cowardly temper. He would not, for any appearance of disgrace, abandon what he judged to be true common advantage, and suffer the enemy to pass over Granaa into Peloponnesus without a battle. But when, after they passed by, news came that they had suddenly captured Plana, he was no longer the same man, nor would he uh, nor would be here of any delay, or nor would he be hearing of any delay or wait to draw together his whole force, but march towards the enemy with such as he had about him to fall upon them. As they were indeed now much less formidable through the intemperances and disorders committed in their success. For as soon as they entered the city, the common soldiers dispersed and went hither and thither into the houses, quarreling and fighting with one another about the plunder, and the officers and commanders were running about after the wives and daughters of the Pelenians, on whose heads they put their own helmets to mark each man his prize and prevent another from seizing it. Now, I don't believe in forced marriage, whether they're the conquered or otherwise, so I'm not promoting that. Um, and in this posture, much, much less uh, forced fornication or whatnot. I know this, this is not the way the phrase it, but you know what, you know what I mean. Um, forced sex of any type is not something that, you know, we do anything except condemn on this channel. Um, I mean, and in this posture were they, when news came that Aratus was ready to fall upon them, and in the midst of consternation likely to ensue in the confusion they were in before, all of them heard of the danger, the outmost of them engaging at the gates and in the suburbs with the Achaeans were already beaten and put to flight, and as they came headlong back, filled with their panic, those that were collecting and advancing to their assistance. In this confusion of the captive's daughters, one of the captives, daughter of Epigethus, a citizen of repute, being extremely handsome and tall, happened to be sitting in the temple of Diana, placed there by the commander of the band of chosen men who had taken her and put his crested helmet upon her. She, hearing the noise and running out to see what was the matter, stood in the temple gates, looking down from above upon those that fought, and having the helmet upon her head, in which posture she seemed to the citizens to be something more than human, struck fear and dread into the enemy believed it to be a divine apparition, so that they lost all courage to defend themselves. But the Pelenians tell us that the image of Diana stands, usually untouched, and when the priestess happens at any time to remove it to some other place, nobody dares look upon it, but all turn their faces from it. For not only is the sight of it terrible and hurtful to mankind, but it makes even the trees by which it happens to be carried become barren and cast fruit. I don't know how that could be the case, unless it's poisonous. Um, this image, therefore, they say, the priestess produced at that time, and holding it directly in the faces of the Atalians, made them lose their reason and judgment. Well, superstition can do that. Um... But Aratus mentions no such thing in his commentaries, but saying that having put to flight the Atalians and falling in pell-mell with them into the city, he drove them out by the main force and killed several hundred of them, and the action was extolled as one of the most famous exploits, and Timanthus, the painter, made a picture of the battle, giving his composition a most lively representation of it. And course, one of the things we need to look out for um, in the government that we support is that first comes the security and the justice and that sort of thing. Then comes the um, 
various forms of social welfare because using because you see how it usually works is they they do just enough to keep people from overturning the government or whatever but they don't do that as well if they're not providing the security and the justice But many great nations and potentates, combining against the Akaans, Aratus immediately treated for friendly arrangements with the Atalians, and making use of the assistance of Pantelayan, the most powerful man amongst them. He not only made a peace, but an alliance between them and the Akaans, but being desirous to free the Athenians, he got into disgrace and ill repute among the Akaans, because notwithstanding the truce and suspension of arms, made between them and the, Mac and the Macedonians, had attempted to take the Hiraas. He denies this fact in his commentaries and lays the blame on Reginus, by whose assistance he took Acro Corinthus, alleging that he, upon his own private account, attacked the Hiraas, and his letters happening to break, being hotly pursued, he called out upon Aratus as a present, by which means deceiving the enemy, he got safely off. This excuse, however, sounds very improbable, for it is not in the way likely that Erginus, a private man and a Surian stranger, should conceive in his mind so great an attempt without Aratus at his back to tell him how and when to make it and to supply him with the means.